Good afternoon, Cassetta participants. Uh, again, we're going uh, live with uh, another speaker. My name is Scott Chase, and I think it's been very, very educational today. And I'm very happy to have a chance to uh, introduce Pat Jacoby. I grew up in Houston, so I know a little bit about Galveston, Pat, so I'm looking forward to your talk. Uh, although Pat has been interested in early American art history since her college days, life led her on a different route, and she spent most of her career in health planning and policy analysis, including earning a PhD in history of medicine from the Institute for the Medical Humanities at University of Texas Medical Branch. Very exciting about that. I'm a health lawyer, Pat, so I, that sounds exciting to me. After retiring, she returned to her earlier interest, co-authoring a compendium of artists associated with the first hundred years of the Galveston Art League. Her recently published book, Early Galveston Artists and Photographers, Recovering a Legacy, grew out of that earlier effort. Thank you for being here today, Pat. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, as Seth said, uh, I uh, worked on doing a compendium of the activities of the Galveston Art League for the uh, for the first hundred years of their existence since 1914 through 2014. Um, and uh, one of the things that we noticed while we were working on that was up until, oh, probably about 1910 or so, the artists that were coming and going from, uh, from Galveston, they didn't stay very long. Um, they uh, they came, uh, they stayed for a little while, they left. All that time, the art um, of Texas, uh, the popularity of it was growing, but it was uh, more or less ignoring uh, the Galveston area, some of the Houston area, uh, focusing, as you know, uh, on the, the hill country, Dallas, um, western, western Texas. Um, my book on the history of, uh, of the early artists and photographers, uh, we started with a long list of people who came through between, uh, oh, in the, in the uh, 19th century, and then limited it down to those for whom we had an example of their work. Um, and then we had to know that they at least had uh, sold their sold their work, or um, or that they advertised as artists uh, later on for uh, reasons I discuss a little bit later. Added the photographers. Um, so what I really want to do is when I, we were writing the book was to try and and urge some further work on studying the Galveston-based artists. Um, slide, please. Uh, Galveston, of course, is an island. Um, people who don't live in Texas are always amazed to find out that it's an island. Um, but in the 19th century, it was a, a very thriving uh, economy. It had the port, um, it had the gulf, it had the bay, uh, it had a lot of very rich people. Uh, it was noted as the Queen City of the Gulf, um, the Wall Street of the South. Um, but when people came in, and many of them had were people who were immigrating from, from Europe, uh, they landed uh, on the island and then it was just simply a boat ride away and they were in Texas. And, and then they had the whole of Texas and they had the whole of the West and and there was California out there in the 1940s and they just sort of left. And the question is, is what made them stay? What made them leave? Next slide, please. Audubon was the first artist known to visit the island. And I figured I might as well start off with, uh, the, with the most famous artist that we've ever had, but he didn't stick around very long. He only stayed about two weeks. Uh, he came for the birds. He was especially impressed with our spoonbills. He had painted the spoonbill before he came to Galveston, but he uh, never stopped studying them. Uh, we know that because of the fact that while he was here, he managed to um, shoot quite a few of them. 
and I'm assuming that he used them as specimens instead of eating them because I can't imagine that they tasted very well. Um, and then until I started putting the slide um, presentation together, I, I, I didn't quite realize that from the time of Audubon, he came in 1837, from the time of Audubon, uh, and then over the next decades that none of the artists that I looked at really focused on the bird life of Galveston. It's one of the 10 top birding spots in the United States. It was probably much better then than it is now because it was so much less occupied, very few residences. Uh, Galveston uh, Audubon called the town uh, that he found at the end of the island, a rough village. Um, and so as a result, but the next person who made a, a, a definite effort to paint the birds of Galveston was Boyer Gonzalez uh, some 50 years later. Next slide, please. Thomas Flintoff is the first person that uh, we could find that we had examples of his work. He was born in England. Um, there seems some question as to where he was um, before he arrived in Galveston. He came in through the port. Uh, he painted portraits. He left for Austin. He disappeared, surfaced in Australia, and where he became appreciated as a portrait painter and as a photographer. The Galveston census in 1850, when he came, uh, was less than 5,000 people. And there were only, according to the 1850 census, 800 places of residence, that is houses, boarding houses, hotels. So as a result, the number of people who could afford to have a, a full, uh, to have a portrait painted of them, especially since there were also photographers who could do uh, de derogatypes for them and uh, much less money um, were rather limited. And when uh, Flint Hoff managed uh, apparently to paint those who wanted to be painted, um, he, he left. Um, then he surfaced again in Australia um, after going through California, he surfaced in Australia where he became quite appreciated as a, as a, as a portrait uh, painter. Next slide. I, I, I put this in because it has nothing to do with Galveston, but still at the same time, it does show uh, a, a plant, fint, <laughs> excuse me, a flint off. It shows a flint off, uh, a painting that we don't have in any of our collections. It was described by one Australian primary school teacher as the cow that swallowed a refrigerator. Um, but he quit painting and turned entirely to photography, setting up a studio in Melbourne. And that's the last we know of him. Next slide. However, when he was in Galveston, he gave us this absolutely wonderful painting of four of William Jefferson Jones' children, um, along with a neighbor's pet fawn. Uh, Jones was a wealthy, well respected man, uh, important in early uh, Texas history, who owned a large tract of land uh, on the mainland just north of where the causeway uh, now uh, begins. Um, and he no doubt helped that off by, by having not only this picture painted, but I'm sure that he probably also ref referred him to some of his friends. Um, but the boy with the peach, the young boy with the peach there later uh, became the mayor of Galveston. So the Jones family interacts with both the history of Texas City, which was laying now lays right north of the land that he owned and of Galveston, uh, which is where uh, they were at the time this was painted. Next slide. Gustavus Adolphus Benet uh, came to Galveston in the late 1850s. He was here for about a decade uh, actively working. Um, I, I said in the book that he was born in Pennsylvania because that's where the sources I found out you cannot only always trust even primary sources is that 
is that uh, I think that he probably was born in Germany. His parents immigrated to the United States before he did, which is an unusual. Uh, and then he studied art and then, and then I think he joined them here. That's currently. Um, he, uh, he when he returned to, to the US or when he came to the US, he married a woman with relatives in Texas and is what happens when people marry a woman with relatives in Texas based on experiences my friends as they end up moving to Texas. Uh, he was established as a portrait painter in Galveston and a very, uh, very popular. Uh, the, the town was beginning to grow, the city was beginning to grow. It was beginning to become more wealthy. The port was busier. There were more people who could hire somebody uh, to port their uh, to paint their uh, portrait. Um, in 1860, a group of people uh, hired him to paint a full body portrait of Sam Houston. And Sam Houston. Uh, was still alive at that time. He posed for the picture. It was said that he, he really liked it. He liked it better than any of the other portraits that were made. But then the Medeas moved to Cuba in 1861 after Texas joined the Confederacy. Um, they, again, the, one of the stories is that they left Cuba and went back to Germany. But I found this ad in the paper in 1866 in the Galveston paper that um, he had returned to was ready to paint portraits um, of any size. Uh, my guess is, is that he, um, he probably returned uh, to pick up his painting because, next slide please, because uh, this is a, a photograph of part of that painting. It's a full body painting. Um, and like I said, Houston really liked it. Um, but it was never purchased. Nobody ever paid Bene for, for doing it. My, again, uh, I don't know why. My guess is since their refusal to um, purchase it coincided with their move to Cuba, as it may be because of his lack of support for uh, their joining the Confederacy. Um, the last that's known of it uh, was as uh, the property of the Daughters of the Republic of Texas. There is some indication that when he returned in 1866, he managed to sell it to somebody. Where it was stored between 1861 and 1866 is, is, is not known. Next slide, please. Lewis Ith, um, was uh, came with a family. It came in through the port, immigrated from Prussia. Uh, he arrived in his teens. Um, he's uh, listed, he listed himself as an artist, as a portrait painter, as a derogatypist in Galveston and Houston and in the city directories and in the census. Um, most of his early work in Galveston was with the Blessing Photo Studio, um, where he did, he worked on something that I would, I would really love to see a copy of is that that um, he, uh, the Blessing Studio took a photograph of each of the 83 members of the Galveston Artillery Club. And then they somehow or other arrayed them in such a way that uh, I th then finished uh, the portrait um, by putting on their uniforms in the background and such things as this, so that you had a watercolor painting in which the, in which the, the people in the painting were actually photographs. Uh, they then uh, put this in, uh, to copies of this and, and photographed copies of it. And anybody from the Galveston Artillery Club that wanted a, co a copy of it uh, could purchase one. Um, I moved to San Antonio in 1878. Uh, to work on some drawings related to history books and, and pamphlets on uh, Texas history. Um, the works included Travis addressing the garrison of Alamo, which he uh, brought back to Galveston and displayed in a photo studio window in 1864 and death of Bowie. Um, his work was described as being two dimensional 
uh, but they but it obviously caught the spirit of the time. He was very very popular as an illustrator of uh, Texas history. Next slide. Yeah, while he was in Galveston, he painted the portrait of Sarah Scott Williams, the wife of Samuel May Williams, um, and uh, who was a, a personal friend of Austin's. And again, like Jones, very, very um, important part of early Texas history. Um, Sarah Scott Williams died in 1860. Uh, the painting was done in 1870. The Rosenberg Library has both of these, uh, both the, the daguerreotype and the um, and the painting. And the resemblance between them, as you can see, is quite striking. There are some liberties taken with the with the dress of, but the uh, the hair, the hat, and everything else is leads one to believe that that he. Uh, that he copied this from the uh, the original photograph, which uh, has deteriorated over time, but would not have been would probably have been rather sharp and and quite good at the time that he painted it. Um, the fact that ad that uh, the ad that uh, Benet had saying that he could paint portraits from photographs. And then the fact that Samuel May Williams or somebody else hired uh, I, to paint Sarah Scott Williams from a photograph um, led me to believe that uh, painted portraits uh, as opposed to photographs were still being held in very high esteem in the 1860s and 1870s. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the reason that I added photographers uh, was because I found that as I was writing about the artists that I kept saying, well, they showed in a photo studio, they worked in a photo studio, um, they were competing uh, with people for portraits uh, with the photographers. Um, and so as a, as a result, I went back and started adding uh, the photographers to the book as well. Um, there were a lot of artists uh, up until oh, the 1900s who got their start working in photography studios. They may have still been painting, but they could earn a living by painting backdrops. Uh, it's not easy to see in this particular photograph, but, uh, but there is a, a woods in the background, some trees, branches. Um, Somebody has artfully uh, set up a bunch of stones for the uh, Ziegler brothers to, to sit on. Um, they, they did uh, lithographs, uh, they hand colored portraits. Uh, and so we're able to uh, make a living uh, while they're working in the photography studios at the same time that they were painting if they were not able to, um, to make enough money just uh, just uh, by, uh, by their art. Uh, the fact that the, the, the photographs and the artists were intertwined allowed the photographers to put down their roots, uh, gave artists a place to show their work. Um, but still at the same time, there were no galleries in, uh, in, in, uh, in Galveston. Uh, if they wanted to show uh, a painting, they had to either show it out of a photo studio, which usually had front windows, or they had to show it someplace else, like in a bookstore or, um, or in uh, uh, any place else that had an area where they could set it up. Um, if the artists had studios, they were usually in their lodging which, uh, which did not allow um, uh, for a great deal of space for exhibition. Uh, next slide, please. Maria Cage Kimball um, is frequently overlooked, mostly because of the fact that uh, as although she painted as most of the people that I cover here, hundreds, uh, 
of paintings and drawings and sketches uh, from, uh, from throughout different parts of the United States that she lived in and in Europe. Uh, there's almost nothing left of anything that she ever did. Uh, but her importance was, she had a, an importance that was sort of outside of, uh, or beside uh, her, her artwork. Um, when the family moved to Texas, uh, most of them stayed in Houston, but uh, she married a Galvestonian. She made her head at her home in, um, in Galveston. Uh, at, uh, her son uh, tragically died of diphtheria at the age of six. And about three or four years later, then her husband died. And leaving her in Galveston with her family up in Houston, and she, uh, she turned to becoming a speaker uh, at women's clubs and teas um, at uh, schools, uh, the, parent, the equivalent of a parent teacher's meetings, as well as a private art teacher um, from the 1870s on through, uh, through the, the 1900s. Um, she left Galveston. Uh, to work as a teacher at a girls' school in Tennessee, which is where she came from. So she may have gone back there because she had relatives, but she didn't like Tennessee. She moved to South Carolina. Uh, she taught there for some years again at a girls' school. Um, and she quit and she traveled through Europe for two years, going all over, painting pictures. She loved taking painting pictures according to the accounts of, of peasants, uh, of people uh, going about their business, uh, making sketches, and then she came back and uh, it made, again, uh, her uh, trips to, to the women's teas and to uh, statewide um, uh, women's meetings. Uh, talking about her travels, showing her artwork, um, but um, but then she uh, took ill. Uh, she died in Houston and is buried in uh, in Galveston. Next slide, please. Uh, Prominent Women of Texas, which was written in 1896, called her one of the most gifted artists of her day. Now. This is one of the things I chose to put in here, knowing that there are collectors who would be looking at this and other people who are uh, interested. I found um, on, uh, on eBay a, um, a photograph of, uh, or a painting, a pastel painting of roses that was signed by Kimball using the signature that is, uh, that is on the slide, shown on the slide. And it, it came from an estate in Tennessee. And so since she had been in Tennessee, I thought this was possibly uh, Kimball. We have one Kimball in the Rosenberg Library, but the problem is, is that it's a, it's a lovely painting that, of, of little puppies in a basket that she did as a copy of another, of a painting that the, the child of a friend of hers really liked. So she made a copy of the painting and she did not sign it. So we have no copy of her, of her actual signature. So I was feeling rather, rather uh, positive about this until uh, I managed to find another four or five paintings that were also signed with the same Kimball signature. Only they all came from an estate sale in Massachusetts, and I have no history whatsoever of Kimball ever being in Massachusetts. So, so anyhow, I'm in the process now of eliminating Kimball's as uh, as the thing as we go along, as anybody who signs Kimball that could not possibly be Kimball, but because of various things like painting. 10 or 15 years after she had died, so I can eliminate them. I'm eliminating them, but I'm still looking. The major thing about Kimball is that Kimball was so convinced that, that um, painting was a moral um, attribute. And that after the storm in 1900, when people began rebuilding all of the hall, all of the, the walls of the schools and of, uh, of the homes, there were no paintings there. And she thought that 
that children who grew up without looking at beauty were sort of morally stunted. And so she, she was very active in trying to get people to, um, to, to promote the art, to get put copies of, of, um, of art that they could find on their walls so that they would be there, they encouraged local artists, uh, said that there needed to be an organization that would promote local art. She died in uh, 1911. Uh, the Galveston Art League was not started until 1914, but it was largely as a result of the work that she had done in the last years of her life. Next slide, please. Jean Trimbrow Morgan was uh, a, a friend um, and a student of uh, Maria Kimball's. Uh, she studied at the Art um, Students League in New York. Um, she came back uh, home again. Um, she came from a very well-to-do family. She married into a well-to-do family. She was a society leader, a civic leader. Uh, she, she painted uh, the Rosenberg Library Museum, has quite a few of her paintings and sketches from um, from the uh, 18, um, late 80, uh, 80s, 90s, and then they suddenly drop off. Uh, they, they ceased just about the time that Maria Kimball died, uh, which makes me wonder if maybe there was some incentive if Maria uh, Kimball was uh, urged her on with her artwork. Uh, but then they just sort of Quit. She and she became much more socially active as children got older. Never did, as far as we can tell, as far as I can tell, never did resume her, her painting. This, this lovely watercolor uh, was done in 1883 when Morgan would have only been 15 years old. At, uh, I, I went back to double check the, the date to make sure it was correct because it was, uh, it was so lovely. Uh, Okay, uh, next slide, please. D. Beebe was a, a well-known artist uh, in the 1890s. Uh, she was a student of Julia Stockweck, who we will discuss later here. Uh, she left Galveston um, when she had finished her schooling and had, uh, uh, and, moved to Florida uh, as, a, as a public school art teacher. She went then to San Francisco, again, as a public school art teacher, ended up in New Jersey as a high school, um, public school art teacher. And then when she retired, she moved to, uh, to New York. She had studied at the Art Student League at the same time as Jean Morgan. They were uh, more or less contemporaries, makes, you know, whether or not there was any any um, um, friendship between them, I, I do not know. Um, she, um, this, this painting here, we have some, there are some, some paintings of hers in the Rosenberg Library, but I chose this one for two reasons. One, because I really love it. And two is because of the fact that it was purchased off of some auction site on the internet and then was given to the Rosenberg Library, so that it is now, um, so it is now in the in the in the public's eye. Uh, next one, please. Julia Stockleth, born in Germany, as so were so many of the people that I've uh, covered here for this. Uh, his his family was already here on the island. Um, and when he came, uh, whether or not it, others joined him, I think there were 17 members of, of the extended stock left. And he was not married, he had no children, but the rest of the family was living here. Uh, he painted scenes of the harbor in the port, and then he put them up for sale, and residents bought them, crew members bought them, visitors. Uh, but the 1900 storm hit with ferocity and killed all but two members of the family, including killing all of the children. Um, you can imagine what that uh, did as far as Stockless was concerned. He, 
he turned his attention um, uh, away from doing the kinds of paintings he had done before and spent more time doing uh, paintings that focused on the destruction, uh, but mostly also on the reconstruction uh, after the storm. He returned to Germany in 1907, he said because of failing finances, uh, that could be because he was no longer selling uh, his paintings uh, over on the on the harbor side, but but uh, but also he mentioned the nightmare of the tidal wave. Um, during the period of time that he was on the island, he was the most referenced private art instructor on the island, um, and uh, he was uh, mentioned in the paper numerous times. Obviously, was a well loved. And, um, and admired uh, person. Uh, and it, uh, there was a great deal of, of uh, news in the paper when he decided to leave. Um, next slide. This is one of his reconstruction paintings uh, called Grade Raising. Uh, I'm sure that uh, many of you, most of you know about the fact of raising Galveston's um, Gulf side 17 feet from sea level to 17 feet above sea level and building the uh, the seawall. And this is part of the construction of it. The house, the White House here is already up on piers as part of it. The canal is uh, allowing uh, the dredging to come in to fill to fill underneath the houses and raise the ground. In the background, there is a dredger, and next to the dredger, there's a sailboat out there sailing. There's some fishermen down in the front here, and their boat, a man on a horse, people just sort of standing on the bridge looking at what's going on. This is hardly a bleak painting. Um, it, it, it is uh, largely hopeful. It shows a Galveston that is uh, recovering. Um, and uh, he had there, the Rosenberg Library has some others of his uh, reconstruction uh, paintings, but this one by far is just absolutely beautiful. Next one, please. Angela McDonald, also McDonald, M-C-D-O-N-N-E-L-L, -L, also M. Angela McDonald. She had many signatures here, was an artist and a private art teacher in Galveston, uh, she was born here. Uh, she studied under Maria Kimball, who did not have a really great opinion of her. Uh, she, Maria Kimball said that she, that Angela uh, had a great deal of skill, but she just didn't really understand uh, discipline. Uh, she, she was, a, which you can sort of see if you look at her history very much. Uh, she, she she left when she was 15 to study in New York and Chicago. Uh, she returned to Galveston where she taught, where she painted, kept going back and forth to Houston as well. Uh, she went to New Orleans where her brother uh, was an architect. Uh, she came back, uh, but she stayed around until the late 1920s when her mother died. Um, and then she took off. In 1914, she was one of the founding members of the Galveston Art League, a frequent co-exhibitor with Paul Schumann. Uh, she went to um, uh, Spain. She spent two, two years in Spain. Uh, she uh, learned to speak Spanish. She had a one woman show in Barcelona. Um, she then, brought all of her paintings and all of her sketches back. Uh, she began doing sort of like Maria Kimball did, speaking at various things, uh, various uh, functions, giving lessons. Uh, interesting thing about her that, that sort of amazes, I'm, I'm not an oil painter and, and I don't know about that, but she, she used gasoline as the medium for her oil which makes me wonder if that has anything to do with the fact that so few of her paintings are, are still around. Um, 
But anyhow, uh, she returned to Houston and then in 1940 around there, she left for New York and she stayed there until she died in 1946. Next slide, please. Um, there's little of her art now, as I was saying, very little of it known. Uh, the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Houston at one time had a couple of her paintings, but I understand they no longer have them. Um, there is this gorgeous triptych um, that she did at the Houston Public Library as part of a WPA project uh, that's up above the rising uh, staircase and it's in strange, very strange uh, colors of orange and peach and such, which she said matched the color of the walls around. The triptych is about the history of Spain. Uh, it has to do with, with a, uh, all the way from the Inquisition and, and uh, through Don Quixote and uh, the, it, it's just, it has nothing to do with Gals, nothing to do with Texas, but it's really lovely. Um, and uh, she has, there's a couple, there's a painting and a couple of drawings of hers at the Rosenberg Library. This one, this one is one of the things that had really pleased me. I found a, a notice that she had had a copyright in 1924 for a, uh, a book plate. Um, and so I contacted the copyright people and the copyright people said that they had sent it over to the Library of Congress archives because there'd been no action on it since 1924. They gave me the uh, email address of, uh, for a woman in the Library of Congress who said that yes, that according to their records, they had it someplace in the archives that I could get it, but that if I had to hire somebody to go through the archives, it would be quite expensive. I explained why I wanted it. And she said, oh, well, I've got some, you know, noon hours free. So she called over, had a couple of boxes brought over and she found it. And uh, I got a copy of it. Um, and uh, it's, it says that it's a lithograph. Um, it is uh, extremely detailed. Um, you could spend, you know, 10, 15 minutes staring at it and finding new things in it but it's small, it's only about four inches. Um, so uh, it's now in the public domain. It has been moved out of uh, the archives into the Library of Congress um, we uh, website and uh, it's now in the public domain and is available for viewing uh, under paintings and images, I believe it is, uh, of Galveston uh, at the Library of Congress. Next slide, please. Boyer Gonzalez. Boyer Gonzalez uh, painted on and off in Galveston throughout his life. He was born into a uh, affluent family. He worked in um, the family cotton industry. When his father died, he, uh, he quit the industry and began to pursue his art. He had been up until this time um, largely self-taught, uh, that's what they said, but uh, of course, at that well, at that point in time, their um, stock theft was not yet there, so there may have not have been uh, art teachers on the island. Um, because of a family connection, he was able to uh, meet uh, Winslow Homer, uh, and Winslow Homer. Uh, um, became a, not only uh, his teacher, but also a friend for many years. Um, Gonzalez would spend uh, most of the year in, in, uh, in Galveston or in, um, in traveling through the Caribbean and, the, and, the, uh, and Mexico and various other places. He and his wife went to Europe for a long time. And he spent a lot of time in Venice, other parts there. And then he would spend his summers uh, with, with, with Homer. Um, so most of his life was spent coming and going uh, from, from Galveston. Um, he, um, about um, all around until the late 1920s, he started spending more time back East. He spent time not only in Maine, but also in upstate New York painting there 
Um, and so much so that uh, a newspaper article in 1932 called him um, a, the, a, former, a former Galvestonian. Um, but nevertheless, uh, his last show uh, that is recorded in the newspaper was in also 1932, uh, which was a joint exhibit with Paul Schumann in uh, Chicago. Um, but uh, uh, he, he, uh, he still came back. His, uh, his general uh, focus of his life was in Galveston. Uh, he's buried uh, with his Gal in Galveston, and after his death, his wife, um, his widow, and donated a large collection of his work uh, to the Rosenberg Library, and they have, I think, it's over 200 copies of his paintings and drawings and sketches, and uh, it's a it's a very very rich um, collection that they have. Next one, please. Next slide. There we go. Um, these are two of the paintings from the Rosenberg collection. Um, the one on the left is uh, looking down uh, over uh, the Strand Street uh, in Galveston on a rainy day um, with the uh, people, the carts uh, and such. And you, you can see that it's a rainy day. It's just, uh, it's lovely. Um, and then the one on the one on the left, the one on the right is uh, of a scene of uh, people, uh, a couple of women hanging out the clothes that was taken probably in one of the tropical islands that he visited. It, you know, outside of the fact that those look like mountains in the back, it could just as easily, um, it just as easily uh, have been done in, in Galveston. Um, he painted, he painted everyday life, no matter where he found it. Um, and you can see his work, you can visit it through uh, Edward Simmons' excellent book uh, with bold strokes on, on Gonzales. Uh, or you can visit the uh, museum uh, archives online at Rosenberg Library. Next slide, please. Paul Schumann. Paul Schumann was Gauss Marvis from the early 18, 1900s to his death. Uh, he's probably, without a doubt, uh, the most uh, well-known outside of Galveston in Texas of our various artists. Um, he came to um, the U.S. when he was three um, and uh, studied under Stockfleth. Um, his uh, early years were spent working in studio in photo studios, um, and uh, he had continued to do that from around 1900 until just before World War One, when his registration card lists him as an artist rather than as a um, a photo retoucher or a lithographer, both of which he did in the photo studios. Um, he started showing exhibits of his work under the Galveston Art League in 1914. He uh, he was he constantly exhibited through the through the Art League, um, he, uh, even during periods of time that uh, that he was not living here. Uh, he would promote um, exhibits of his work. As I said, he often showed with Angela McDonald. Um, his last, uh, in 1932, he showed with uh, the, the show in Chicago with, um, with Gonzalez. Um, and uh, he, he really believed that Gallison had the potential of being a, a recognized, what we now call an art destination. Uh, he kept pushing and pushing people uh, to bring in um, exhibits from museums and galleries back east and from Chicago. Um, and, uh, and all that time he was also teaching uh, he, uh, some, of the, some of the artists uh, in Galveston from the 1930s, 40s and 50s uh, were, um, were, were students of his. Next one, please. 
Um, he painted, uh, which um, most of the painters, most of the artists that um, painted Galveston tended to paint from the side of the port and the harbor, like the um, Mosquito Fleet painting on the uh, right in this slide. It's the, the ships and the coming and going and all the activity that was over there. Schumann, he turned his attention to the South as well. He did uh, absolutely fantastic um, paintings of waves and uh, rocks and, uh, and uh, um, fishermen who were out there, people were casting their lines from, from the rocks, uh, the shrimp boats out sailing around. It, it, it was not like anything else that uh, people had been, had been doing in the past. Um, and uh, in earlier today, when we were going through the various art galleries, he was the only Galveston artist that was mentioned uh, during that particular episode. Uh, I had the privilege of interviewing a woman five years ago uh, who had studied under Schumann when she was a small child. Um, and she and her cousin, uh, took classes, uh, took lessons from him, uh, but she quit uh, after a, a period of time. I asked her how long, and she said, oh, months. After some months, she quit because she was bored. She said all he did is he just set us up there and had a sketch. He just had a sketch. He gave us, you know, and we, that's all we could do. And then, and then he he would have us look at something for a long period of time, and then we were supposed to go home and draw it. And she said, I, I didn't really see any sense in that. And I wanted to paint. I wanted to get the colors. And he said, No, no, that we wouldn't have colors for two or three years at the rate we were going. We just needed to sketch. And so she quit. But her cousin continued. Uh, her cousin was. Um, David Moore, who's the sculptor who, who did the um, 1900 Storm Memorial that's down on the, uh, on the seawall. Um, my friend who, uh, who told me about this, uh, who's since died, she was in her late 90s when I interviewed her, um, it was uh, Eugenia Harris Campbell, uh, who was a, a, a very, very good artist, but she was an abstract artist and she only painted in colors. Um, next one, next slide, please. Uh, these are the major artists who were working in Galveston in the 1890s and early 1900s. And all, all of these were on the island right around 1900. Um, the, some of them left shortly after, some of them appeared shortly before, but they were all here around that period of, oh, 1898, 1902, around there, they were all here. Um, and and I, I, I've looked at them all sort of horizontally, just across their lives and as it is, but it would really be fascinating to look at them vertically as well as to the interaction between them. We do know that Schumann and Stockfleth were good friends. Uh, they were also friends with, um, with um, sure. Um, Lundquist, with Lundquist, when he, he was on the island, he used to come and visit his family here in the late 1890s. And the, the, uh, they were all German. They were part of uh, the German society, the German social clubs. Uh, so we know that there was some interaction between them. The, the three people that I have here in, in, uh, in brackets, uh, I didn't cover, but they were also here at that point in time. August Rolfing was also a German that was part of that German group. 
Um, but all, his work was, all of it was in his house and his house was totally destroyed in the 1900 storm. Uh, thankfully, everybody in his family managed to survive, but nevertheless, he never went back to painting again. He became a sign painter, uh, commercial artist. Um, John O'Brien is a sculptor, uh, not much known about him. It was a very private man, uh, but he did the bust of, uh, of um, Houston, Sam Houston, that is still in the rotunda as the capital in, in Austin. And E.B. Harris, uh, who came just about eight, uh, 1899, I believe, um, considered himself a commercial artist, even though he was probably one of the best portrait painters that we that we have seen. A lot of and again, some of his work is uh, is available at the Rosenberg Library. Uh, some of his portrait work, but he he was also an electrician, um, and uh, he was uh, uh, fascinated by the history of trains. He was just sort of an all around person who didn't consider himself to be an artist. I would love to know, however, if there was any relationship between Angela McDonald and BB, who were um, who were uh, sort of contemporaries of each other, and both of them ended up in Manhattan. Um, did they know each other or is just that both coincidence? I, I really, I really don't know. Um, next one, please. Uh, the takeaways from this, really the top one is the only real takeaway from the, from the research behind this particular um, presentation. Uh, but the, the greatest difference between those who left and those that stayed or returned was whether they had a family or a cadre of close friends on the island. Uh, the, the ones who left were sort of solitary people or they had lost like uh, Gonzalez and um, McDonald, uh, the, the family that was there had moved away and the parent who they stayed in, uh, in touch with and uh, died. And so they were free to leave. Um, they left very young. Uh, many of them, especially the women were never married. Uh, there was, uh, but those who had a family, like for instance, if Stockleth's family had not been killed in the 1900 storm, he probably would have stayed. Uh, certainly, the Schumann family was uh, was a strong force for keeping Schumann on the island, um, and um, uh, Gonzalez, his wife, was still here when he was roaming around on the uh, on uh, Maine and New York in his later years, um, and uh, he had a son that was here, and he constantly was returning to the island uh, for them. I think he also had a sister. Uh, so, uh, as as the as the city developed and people began finding uh, homes here, establishing homes, uh, the artists had less impetus to leave. At least, if they left, they had uh, they had reason for coming back. Uh, the other two are sort of underground type of things that I, I found in doing them, and that was that. Galveston was just simply not Texas enough to get the attention of galleries and art patrons uh, who lived on, most of them on the East Coast or in Chicago. And you can see that again. Um, the the um, Galveston in many respects is more East Coast than it is Texas. Um, and um, yeah. <laughs> It, it, uh, that it was in Texas. I just got a notice here to have to talk about Houston. And yes, I do have to talk about Houston. Um, Houston was the closest thing that there was to Galveston in terms of an art mecca, but it was during the 1900s still eclipsed by uh, Dallas and by the hill country and by the love of people of things that they considered to be Texas, like cowboys and Indians and, and wide open spaces and cattle. Uh, and, and so, you know, pictures of people on the backyard hanging up their clothes did not, was not Texas enough. It just was not Texas enough. 
And uh, tied to that was the fact that the Galveston residents were constantly amazed to learn that local, local artists were almost as good as artists from Europe or the East Coast. They, the, the newspaper articles, they had critics and they would write these newspaper articles and say, we were so impressed with what we saw, it was almost as good as the Woodstock School, even though two or three of the painters that they saw had studied at the Woodstock School, but nevertheless, they, they were sort of dismissed. And to, to some extent, as somebody who's lived here now for over 30 years, that is, that is still absolutely true. I still hear people when I'm working, for instance, in the Art League Gallery, I still hear people who come in and say, oh, this is good. Is this from some Texas artist? This is, is this from a Galveston artist? And I'll say yes. And they'll say, oh, well, it's really good. <laughs> so anyhow, it's something I think we're going to need uh, to, to learn with is this uh, self-deprecation, uh, although somewhat muted, um, is still very much indicative of, uh, of Galveston art. So with that, if there are any questions, I would be happy to take them. Pat, uh, thank you for that uh, talk. It was uh, very informative. Obviously a lot of great time and research and effort has been put into this. Um, and so to that, before we take any questions, I wanted to ask about the book that this all went into. Uh, can you share uh, with us? I know it was just recently published uh, where we can get it and uh, the title of it and all of that great information. Uh, well, the title is uh, Early Galveston Artists and Photographers. Um, and then you need a colon. I, I understand that nothing is really scholarly unless it has a colon in it. So mm -hmm. it's Early Galveston Artists and Photographers Discovering a Legacy. Or, I'm sorry, recovering a legacy. I've been at this too long. Recovering a legacy. Uh, it was published by uh, the um, History Press, part of the Arcadia um, Publishing Company. Um, it has um, here. It is. You know, I really can't see it. <laughs> uh, I keep it. It's sort of next to me all the time, so I keep checking and finding mistakes in it and checking things because they're right. Um, anyhow, is that uh, uh, it, uh, it's available, um, well, of course we sell it at the art gallery, uh, but it's available on all the common things like Amazon and, you know, Barnes and Noble. Um, I managed the other day, I was in the CVS pharmacy here in town and I found it uh, sitting up next to the pharmacy shelf. And I told the pharmacist that that I had written it and uh, she bought a copy, which was nice of her. And, and, uh, and then I, I went and got the little stickers that the History Press sent me and went back and signed all of the copies that were there. And I noticed that the seven copies is now down to three. So I think I'm doing my own marketing as well. Uh, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, it was, uh, I started it before the pandemic. I was able to go to the Rosenberg Library and get a lot of the information that I wanted there. And that was very, very helpful. And then everything shut down. So the last three, uh, the last three months of it were done under, under lockdown, which created some degree of problems. But um, uh, it has a full color insert and that, that, I mean, I really worked hard for that one. I, you can't, you can't do these things. So there's, there's uh, 30, 32, 32 colored photographs in, uh, wow. in the middle. Um, and uh, I must say that everybody that I worked with at, uh, at, uh, at the uh, Houston Museum and at the State House and the, and uh, 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 Rosenberg and everybody was just really helpful in helping to put it all together. That's great. Um, we have time for about one more question. Um, 
Of course, some of these artists weren't in Galveston all that long. Um, was that challenging doing a lot of research on some of them or in, and how did you overcome some of those challenges? One of the very nice things is that um, the Galveston newspaper has been around as long as Galveston had been. And their archives are, uh, are really very good. Now, there's also the frustration of finding something and then seeing when you bring it up online that it's nothing but a blur. But I was able to find things on some of these people going back to the 19, 1840s and 1850s. Uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the newspaper archives, especially under lockdown, that was uh, an essential uh, source. Okay, great. Um, I um, had one, one more. Um, what is your next research project? Have you already... <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I want to go into the lives of a couple of these people a little bit deeper, especially Maria Kimball and uh, Angela McDonald, because I do have information on them, letters from them and such things as this, but I don't know what I'm going to do with it after I do, maybe. Uh, I, have, I have no idea. I'm looking at magazine articles at the moment, so not enough for a book. Okay. Well, Pat, thank you very much uh, for that. And of course, we will put a link um, in uh, the chat feature to, to find your book. Um, and of course, we heard we can get some signed ones at the CVS and uh, Gal. <laughs> uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining us. So um, thank you. Thank you for the chance. Of course, you take care. Hello, Howard. Hi, hey, Scott. How are you doing? Uh, well, I want to uh, end the uh, 2021 forum with, I wish I had a drink in my hand. I would toast everybody with a huge <laughs> toast, but I think we owe an applause and heartfelt thanks to Bonnie and Sarah Beth and particularly Caleb and uh, Blanca for putting all this together technically. And it went very smoothly, I thought. So, I'm going to clap for everybody, and I hope everybody else is, is applauding what this uh, what we did tonight. So I'll turn it over to you for a few comments, too. Sure. Well, Scott, it's uh, both exhilarating and kind of sad to come to the end of all this. And uh, behind the scenes, there's a big sigh of relief because the uh, technology is pretty challenging. You know, it's not uh, the great science yet, but I think we... Uh, it's amazing. Even the timing has been uh, perfect. I wanted to make just a couple of quick observations. What a wonderful way to end uh, looking at the collectors. Now, I do want to make a warning. Uh, if you're a collector already or you're uh, thinking about becoming a collector, uh, let me make you aware that this can become an addiction, if not an affliction. Uh, you may have noticed in a couple of our visits that uh, art not only hangs on the walls, but begins to line the bottom of the walls. It's in the bathrooms, it's in the closets, and I promise you it's even under the beds. And uh, now us museum people like that because uh, as Randy kind of alluded to at the end there, uh, uh, we are hoping that a destination not soon, but eventually uh, to all these great works of art will not uh, exclusively be to San Angelo, but to many other museums. Uh, and uh, I did, uh, I was pleased to see that Randy pointed out that he, uh, has made some contributions to our museum in San Angelo, which gives them a little more space, I guess. So yeah. uh, just one last, uh, well, a couple of observations, but I just wanted to say that, uh, and I think you said it earlier, Scott, that uh, I learned so much and I really did. I took notes all day long. Uh, and sometimes it's strange little things. I've been in the art world 50 years. I should know what monkey pod wood is. I had to look it up, uh, but it's a medium and uh, unique medium used by sculptors. Uh, but thinking, reflecting broadly on our uh, symposium or actually forum today, uh, true cultural diversity represented, uh, different mediums, and I think especially different kinds of voices. Uh, and I think about this maybe more than a lot of people who observe because it was scholars, curators, and curators are a form of scholars, certainly, collectors, dealers, and then 
an artist and uh, artists especially see things uh, very differently, I think, sometimes than all the other folks. And uh, so I particularly enjoyed Noe's presentation. And I do want to get a plug in for his book. It's coming out at A&M soon. And uh, I had the privilege of reading the manuscript. And boy, I'm going to tell you, it's a very informative book about uh, early Texas art. Uh, interestingly, and in, uh, encapsulized in all that about uh, the King Ranch. And then the images, uh, Noe's images are just brilliant. Scott, back to you. Thank you. I, I want to close with uh, three points, I guess. One, I want to follow up a little bit on your comment about the diversity and uh, the, of the scholars and every, uh, all our presentations. Uh, I'm committed for the 2022 symposium in person to be as uh, diverse and as uh, eclectic as we were for this forum. And uh, to that end, anybody who has uh, any ideas about programs, uh, presentations, please send them to Howard or me. Uh, we will take them under advisement. We're going to put together the symposium committee very soon uh, to try to get us a, a good start. Uh, but I want to put a plug in for the symposium in June. As I said yesterday, we've got great room rates. We've got great dealer space, a lot of room. It's a beautiful place. It's a brand new renovated uh, Hilton Hotel with easy access uh, off the freeway. And so I, I uh, encourage everybody to set aside June 10th and 11th. I also want to quickly uh, point out the recording that will be later in the week of this uh, forum. So if you missed anything, go back to that and uh, put in a plug for Howard's uh, museum. If you have archives, you don't necessarily have to have uh, paintings to send to Howard. I know there are people who send archives to Howard too. So. Uh, if there's any uh, further discussion, feel free to contact any one of us. I had a great time. I know Howard had a great time, and I hope everybody else had a great time during these two days. So with that, I will say adios. A golden sunrise brightens up an ashen morning sky. A hazy purple sunset says goodbye at twilight time That big old yellow Texas moon is mine and only mine It's just Texas, being Texas ain't she fine Blue stem grasses weighted down by early morning dew Indian paintbrush, black-eyed Susan's bonnets painted blue Honey bees are buzzing round a honeysuckle vine. It's just Texas being Texas in her prime. It's just Texas being Texas, the place I love the most. Dry winds of the western plains or salt air of the coast. From the lazy days of summer to the chill of winter time. It's just Texas being Texas and she's mine A white-tailed doe is watchful as a fawn lays by her side A baby raccoon finds a hollow tree where he can hide The silence of the forest broken by a raven's cry It's just Texas being Texas, she ain't shy I hear voices of the settlers who have passed this way before I see ghosts of horsemen riding across the open plains once more As they trail the longhorn cattle from another place in time It's just Texas being Texas in my mind It's just Texas being Texas, the place I love the most Dry winds of the western plains or salt air of the coast From the lazy days of summer to the chill of winter time 